let's talk about the Olympics. The Tokyo Olympics, one of the biggest sporting events in the world, was scheduled to begin on July 24th this year. In ordinary times, we would have been following the action, the inspiring performances and the tragic misses by athletes. But these are no normal times. The pandemic has pushed the event by a year and it's now scheduled to begin on July 23rd, 2021. But in what form will it be held remains the big question. Will we have crossed the worst phase of the pandemic by then? Will a vaccine have arrived to give us hope? Many questions remain both for the International Olympic Committee which organizes the event, the host team in Tokyo and the athletes around the world. We'll be looking into some of these issues but first here are the details. The 32nd Olympics was scheduled to be held from 24th July as we mentioned to 9th August 2020. It will now be held from July 23rd to August 8th 2021. This is the second time Tokyo will be hosting the Olympics after 1964. The 2020 Summer Paralympics for Disabled Athletes will also be held in Tokyo from August 24th to September 5th next year. The Olympics is expected to have 339 events in 33 different sports and representatives from anywhere between 150 to 200 countries are likely to participate. Over 11,000 athletes are likely to take part. A major controversy has been over the participation of Russia, which was banned by the World Anti-Doping Agency for four years for allegedly tampering with data provided to the global body. Russian athletes may have to take part under some other banner, although Russia has appealed the decision. The economic impact of the postponement is very difficult to calculate. The official budget is 1.35 trillion yen, which is $12.6 billion. Although reports say that a much larger amount of money has already been spent on the whole process from the bid onwards. The estimates that the global economy of the country could suffer a $6 billion US dollar hit this year, although much of this may be recovered if that is held next year. Like we said, the key question, of course, is, is under what conditions this event will be held. Will there be crowds? Will there be international spectators? There are indeed many unknowns. We talked to NewsClick's Leslie Xavier on this issue. Thank you, Leslie, for joining us. So uh, the Olympic Games in a normal world would have started by now. The date of uh, the scheduled date was July 24th this year. And of course, as we know, nothing is normal right now. And so the proposal, as far, as far as I understand, is that it will be held next year, July 23rd. And so could you talk a bit about what has been happening in the Olympic circles, so to speak, regarding the postponement itself, what's the kind of thinking that's going on, and what is the planning going on for the proposed event next year? So the new dates, so the games start exactly a day uh, uh, exactly a year away from now so uh, i mean uh, it's on july 23 2021 so last week on 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 the 23rd they had a small occasion i mean small very subdued because nobody was in the mood to celebrate or commemorate one year to go once again because last year the same thing happened right. and the circumstances are also pretty grim in that sense because the world is still fighting and uh, I mean, if if not exactly a losing cause, but still it's not under control, the virus situation. Right, right. So uh, the stakeholders of the Olympic Games, the IOC, the Japanese government, the organizing committee in Tokyo, they are all, I mean, pretty realistic about the scenario is. And uh, in fact, uh, Yoshiro Mori, the organizing committee president, he, uh, he, he was quoted as, say, uh, quoted as saying by the Japanese official broadcaster NHK in one of the programs that uh, it's it's not just about whether if and when and what Olympic Games it's about humans winning a battle against this virus so uh, I mean once that happens then everything else will fall in place so he was hinting at vaccine and uh, being the being key to the fortunes of the Olympic Games as well having said that the organizers are again looking beyond into a scenario where vaccine i mean even if it's not in place how can they conduct the games because ioc and generally it is understood that uh, if the games are not held in the given dates next year then it would be cancelled altogether because it's it's logistically calendar wise everything impossible to organize it in any other dates so uh, and also the financial implications are also I mean, the, state, the sponsors and all the infrastructure that have been put into organizing the event by the Japanese government. Everything uh, is, is at stake here. So they are thinking of uh, organizing it with, with the protocols in place, which, mm -hmm. which ensure safety of the players, 
officials. So, I mean, in a normal games, if it was held this year, I mean, this year, if uh, then around 11,000 athletes, we would have seen convene in Tokyo. Uh, a support cast of around 40,000 uh, officials plus, uh, I mean, almost the same amount of volunteers and media persons. So it's it. Uh, so maybe a smaller uh, kind of a setup. They are they are mulling in case vaccine is not out by then, uh, where athletes would be allowed. They would they would ensure a green channel where athletes can be flown in and flown out. In fact, uh, there are many countries who are thinking of bringing the athletes just for the event and taking them out, just like that. Because this quarantine system won't work because logistically it would be a nightmare. Fourteen day coming in quarantine. It's not like. How the West Indies travel to England and they had the luxury because it's just two teams and fifteen set of fifteen players involved. This is huge. So, so uh, testing would be done and players would be flown in. Competitions will happen. Maybe spectators may not be allowed to travel. Foreigner spectators, but Japanese spectators might be allowed in because IOC again is very clear that they wouldn't hold the games without spectators. But uh, uh, again, foreign spectators bringing in. Is 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 again a uh, point of contention, a point of doubt. And uh, as far as within the stadium, at least be able to uh, concern. Of course, a lot of action have started cricket, football. So there are certain protocols that have been established, which would be, which the athletes would be, I um, mean, expected to follow within the stadium, including celebrations like shouting, ah, things like that, including that, including. Uh, behavior in the games village where social distance, uh, physical distancing would be implemented. So things like that are are, are being mulled as Plan B. But of course, the wait is on for the uh, vaccine to come out. So uh, to just go a bit more into this, uh, the uh, Olympics, as we understand, is not only a event for two weeks. It's also something, and you've written about this. It's also something that has. Uh, long-term impact on athletes' careers and development itself and is actually a cyclical process uh, in that sense because it's not just about the competition. So do you, so could you talk a bit about how that aspect might be impacted if, for instance, it doesn't happen? So uh, one, uh, one direct implication is the financial implication. And when we talk about financial implication, the first thing that and first thing and the foremost thing that everyone talks about is is the losses suffered by the organizers, by the sponsors and all that. But the revenue generated from the Olympic Games, it's the cut goes to the International Olympic Committee. And so IOC, what it uses, I mean, it's, it uses it for, for its own functioning. And at the same time, it has a lot of developmental programs across the world. And especially countries, the, the poorer countries benefit from it a lot. The athletes get, uh, get a share of uh, the money for sporting activities. And uh, also that, that falls into the Olympic cycle as such because uh, this is a junior grassroots development program. So it's a, it's a long-term investment for IOC in that sense or for the sporting movement in that sense. Absolutely. Because in the long run, these athletes are expected to come up and uh, increase the reach and the stature of the Olympic movement, movement as such. So that entire cyclic process, which has been, uh, which is a four-year cycle, is, mm-hmm. is, is, will get disrupted if the games, games, the chain of games are broken. And at the same time, it's also evident that whenever the Olympic games have been broken, the uh, larger implication is that the world has not been in a great shape when this has happened. So, uh, the two times it has been cancelled happens to be during the World, world Wars. And uh, of course, uh, those days, the world being not as, as, as small as it is now, uh, the, the cascading implications of it was, and Olympic movement was also at a pretty nascent stage. So the cascading implication of it on a global scale uh, is, is, was pretty minimal that way. Because for instance, if you look at the 40 and 44 games being cancelled, uh, India being a, I mean, not, having not gained independence at that point and sport ne- definitely not exactly being a priority at that moment. Uh, mm-hmm. Sport developing prog- development programs and all that were, were, were not in place, things like that. And also not connected with IOC in any manner. IOC ne- never had stakes in all these country development programs. 
so uh, impact remained with the games itself and the organizing city but now it's a different state altogether the 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 effect is not just confined to tokyo the effect would be global and uh, and that would last a few game cycle if not more as far as the development uh, stunting of the development is, is right. concerned right and finally just a quick look on what's happening to some of the significant important indian athletes who were supposed to participate where have they reached with regards to their preparation their careers and how is this whole process actually it has it derailed their training and stuff like that so uh, it's derailment as well as happened with time uh, many of the athletes were in camp uh, continue being in camps but then things have started getting to them uh, psychologically mm-hmm. physically also because training is not exactly in the intensity that it is supposed to be mm-hmm. and uh, psychologically in the sense they have some families and some i mean the related pressures that come with it some of their family being family members or kin being in places where pandemic is on the rise right, so they are right, tense about right. all those things and how long can I, i mean it's it's like solitary confinement in a way also right how long can an athlete remain in in a camp kind of a facility with, with no external contact as such so there have been uh, a few athletes who have asked permission to leave go go home many have left home even without permissions uh, many are mulling things like that and uh, we at news click uh, uh, we broke a story about Bajrang Punia, who was a medal winning mm-hmm. uh, uh, prospect for Tokyo, right. uh, world number two wrestler, and so he his coach is a Georgian, and he had flown back on to Georgia in March. Now he is coming back on July 30. Will land in Delhi. He has made right. some arrangement with the Georgian government to come back a special case because. Uh, Bajrang Punia is uh, as as far as his training is concerned is is struggling and yeah. wrestling being the high intensity sport that is and also the reality that in the coming months there won't be much competition for him or any of the elite wrestlers in the country and by elite wrestlers we know for sure that some of them are medal i mean sure shot bets for for medals right at at the game so uh, him coming back i mean that is one one positive possibly for bajrang because then at least some sort of control and uh, because bajrang has risen to world number one stature and won world championship medals under the disc coach the trust right. between them the relationship yeah. between them is huge so that would make a difference so individually there are so certain movements that are happening towards training and all that but at the same time i came to know that the wrestling or any sport for that matter federations are very very I mean, and understandably very uh, reserved about opening up and training full fledged and also very re- reserved about t- taking these athletes abroad to train yeah. for instance there is this uh, suggestion by bajrang's coach again that georgia is in a better place according to him uh, to train because the country is in the green as far as covid cases are concerned compared to india and uh, it can ensure safety he said but then uh, permissions are not not there and and in 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 some ways that is right too because probably the government feels or the sports ministry feels that it would be better off if they have direct control over the athlete circumstances being in a camp here or being in some private facility where where safety and all other protocols can be directly monitored by the sports ministry or the sports authority of india so that is one case and there is another i mean a, a sort of like a landmark now now that we have very few sporting landmarks uh an indian athlete competed for the first time since 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 lockdown shravani nanda who is from odisha she is a 400 meter runner olympian and she shifted to jamaica to train at the start of this year from january she has been based in kingston and so uh, she competed in a local race there and becoming the first indian athlete to compete post the covid outbreak uh she finished third in her heats if uh, i mean for the record that way and and when i say local competition in jamaica it's it's by no means a small competition because in that field there was the reigning olympic champion running the race too so so a good experience for shravani no doubt and then she was quoted in the uh, in the agencies about about her training and how 
she's lucky. I mean, it's it's a luck and chance kind of a scene because Jamaica is a better off country that way as far as COVID infections are concerned. And it's also a better off country for any athlete to train because we are talking about training and competing and brushing your shoulders with world level athletes, world champions, all of the medalists. So that is one small significant positive to look at sporting. But at the same time, at the administrative level, a lot of muck is being thrown around in India because Indian Olympic Association is in is a, is in a big turmoil. The president of the IOA as well as the secretary general, they are divided into camps and they are fighting each other, throwing, mm-hmm. throwing allegations and showing proof of uh, misdemeanors and all that. So that is, I mean, at this hour of crisis, I mean, our administrators being like such, uh, I mean, it's, it's unfortunate because I, this is the hour that they should come together and plan so that our guys, I mean, our medal officials as well as the normal athletes or even at the grassroots, whoever the kids who are coming up and all that, they should, they need all the support, all the guidance, all the structural, uh, uh, the way, the structure for a way ahead. Uh, forward that should be in place and it can only be planned by systematically by by the people who are um, in the chair occupying the chairs now but they are busy fighting each other so that's that's on the administrative front so this is more or less a quick update on what is happening on the india right. scene thank you leslie so much for talking to us news click sports desk is releasing a series of features around the olympics to read them do visit newsclick.in slash sports our next story is on the covid 19 impact in south africa the country is among the worst affected by the pandemic and has the fifth highest number of cases and of yesterday had the fourth highest number of new cases. To know more about this, we talked to Dr. Lydia Caincross of the People's Health Movement last week. Here is a section of the interview. Could you talk a bit maybe about what's the situation on the ground right now? Because uh, we do know that the government has been pushing for reopening. And interestingly, South Africa was one of the countries which did have a very uh, strong lockdown. So how is it that despite yes. that, the number of cases continues to yeah. yeah, I think South Africa, um, you know, we started off with the, with the approach to the pandemic of a very strict and very hard lockdown, one of the, the hardest in the world, um, for about five weeks. Um, and during that time, there was a quite slow transmission of the virus. We think that because it was mainly um, sort of initially a middle class inoculation into the society, Um, And we have a a very class segregated society, which is the legacy of apartheid and and of capitalism. Um, And so for for some time, the lockdown worked. Um, But the lockdown came at tremendous cost, um, tremendous cost to primarily um, the poor um, and the poor black majority in South Africa. And it revealed the uh, tremendous uh, food insecurity within the country and income insecurity. And the state was not able to rapidly move to fill those gaps. So there was a pressure to lift lockdown, both from a conservative sort of um, capital economy lobby, which wanted to get uh, profit going and get factories running. But there was also a pressure from from the ground, from people who were starving, um, who actually were unable to fulfill their normal livelihoods, which was the microeconomy in the townships, um, you know, the informal economy, which had been decimated by, by the lockdown. And of course, what we had needed at that stage was a very strong social uh, support package to come in rapidly to support income security, to support food security, to bring to communities water and food and sanitation and, and, and money to allow them to survive the lockdown. But we were unable to make that shift. And so there was this pressure and the, a fairly uncoordinated opening of the economy. Um, uh, sort of the strongest lobby uh, pushing would would get their sector open. So one of the first areas to open was mining, which you know makes no sense in terms of a of a health and epidemiology point of view. And and then um, uh, kind of opening of of churches and um, opening of of big sectors of the, the the economy that were not necessarily what we would consider to be essentials for life. You know, which is a more kind of social perspective on what do we need to survive and what can we keep closed in order to keep us safe. The other problem was that we didn't utilize the lockdown as we should have. Um, So the lockdown time um, was really an opportunity to get two things going. The one is a mass popular education campaign to empower communities to understand the virus, to begin to, to know how when lockdown lifted, how to move safely in the presence of the virus. And 
that mass campaign has still not happened. And there are pockets of education happening by NGOs, social movements like ourselves, but not nearly enough. And the other thing that needed to happen in that time was mass testing, um, tracing, and, and, and quarantine. And our, our testing capacity really failed us at this time. And, and because we were not able to escape the logic of, of, of the capitalist system and bring together our public and private testing capacity, we still had a two system binary with private sector capacity with short turnaround times of a few hours to one day or so, and the public sector capacity, which was totally overstretched by the numbers. So we got our community health workers out there, they screened and they sent for testing and within a few weeks we overwhelmed our testing capacity. So when we started to open up the economy, we didn't have the testing capacity that we needed to be able to test and, and to separate out those that were sick and take care of them in that way. So here we are, now we, have, we are number five in the world. Um, our, our, our peak is, is coming later than other countries, but it's coming. Um, and, you know, the numbers are always contested and the deaths are, are contested as well. But we are seeing this in our hospitals. So we are seeing the epidemic. In, for a long time, our hospitals were quiet from a COVID point of view. Um, but certainly uh, started in the Western Cape province and now is moved to our, our most densely populated province in Gauteng. Um, and the hospitals are seeing the influx of patients with, with COVID symptoms short of breath. So it's here. You can watch the full interview at NewsClick's YouTube channel. That's all we have time for today. We'll be back tomorrow with major news developments from the country. Until then, keep watching NewsClick.